Welcome to episode 117 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live March 8, 2019. This is a show about Office 365, Azure, and the IT Pro and end user side of life, where we discuss a topic or recent news related to Office 365 or Azure and how it relates to you as an IT Pro. Today, we answer a listener question about Azure subscription and resource governance by diving into Azure Scaffold. Happy Friday, Scott. (laughs) And what's so happy about it? I don't know, because you forgot about me. I'm kind of hurt, actually. So I don't know that I'm happy. Maybe I'm sad. I did. I need a calendar in front of my eyeballs. Yeah, so you said you needed smart contacts so that... Smart contacts, smart glasses, because clearly having my watch buzz for the last half hour and my phone going off in my pocket repeatedly was not enough to clue me in that there was someplace else that I was supposed to be. Yes, well, I just sat here very lonely trying to hold back tears while I waited for you to show up to record our podcast. Well, we're here now. Yes. And, uh, well, I'm here. You're here. You were already here. I've been here. And to be fair, I don't know that it was you or if it was the InfoPath migration I'm doing. We're talking, I'm doing a 2007 to SharePoint Online migration and I'm doing the InfoPath form because I'm going to GCC and there's no power apps. So InfoPath is like my only option. Uh, you know, heroes come in many forms. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I'm a hero from a glutton for punishment. Yes. It's ugly. Don't do it. Don't wait to upgrade. And if you do upgrade, figure out something to do other than InfoPath. But I was thinking about this the other day. The forms options for SharePoint Online still are really terrible. There's no good replacement. They're immature. (laughs) Yeah, but that's a whole nother episode. We are not going to talk about InfoPath and Power Apps today. I am just need a shoulder to cry on for the misery I'm in. Oh, well, uh, I'm always here for you. And I, I'm right. sure well, there's somebody on Twitter when you're not, who will... Except who when will you don't show up. ...let you complain as well. All right. Let's go cry about something else. And that is going to be... A listener question. Ooh, yay. I like Ta-da. these. We need sound effects. Takes all the effort out of us having to come up with something to talk about. Yes. So this is from somebody in Belgium. How would you pronounce that name in Belgian or the English equivalent? Is it Jan? Jan Peter? I don't know. Yep. I will say yes and not attempt myself because I'm really horrible at names. I'm a little bit better at Twitter handles, but I'm, I'm pretty bad at names. And then we'll probably get corrected. But he had a question about kind of resource governance in Azure. Subscriptions, resource groups, naming convention, tagging, kind of the approach, best practices around some of these topics and how you layer them all together, what you should think about as you start configuring these resources at these different levels to manage them. So it kind of follows up a little bit on what we talked about a couple weeks ago now, I think it was, with Sarah, where we talked more about the tools. This is going to be more about how to structure your resources in a way that makes sense for managing them. And I thought this would be a fun one because we can run through a lot of the practical guidance that's out there. So I think I can provide some insight into things that will be available to everyone. So publicly consumable either out there in documentation or if you're a Microsoft partner, I can point you to some other resources on the back end, which can greatly accelerate your governance lifecycle, especially when we're talking about planning or building out what I would call a little bit of a functional specification to get ready for implementation. And the nice thing about a lot of this stuff is it doesn't matter if you're in an established Azure I'll call it an Azure estate today, where you have one or more subscriptions, you've already deployed resources, things like that, or you're not in an established or grounded place. So if you're just getting going and you're saying, hey, I'm interested in Azure and we're getting ready to buy it, what what are the kind of first things that we should think about or we should do? You know, you'll be able to apply these same constructs there as well. You know, I think it'll be fun to run through. All right. I agree. And this is something, I've done a little bit of this, but yeah, I haven't spent a ton of time really looking at that structure top to bottom. So let's start at the top level or where the question starts and we may go up a level. But the first thing was, or the first part of the question, he actually phrased it in like six different questions. But the first part is, creating subscriptions. Do you create multiple subscriptions? Do you separate out across a bunch of them? Do you just create one big one? Or do you even go up to a higher level? And we were talking about this a little bit on 
how subscriptions fit with Azure AD and even how like an EA portal may fit into this if you have an EA portal. So where would you start kind of at that subscription level or even a level up from subscriptions when it comes to managing your Azure resources? Yeah, so there's a couple things that are going to come into play here and it's going to be a little bit of a weird conversation because I think it's two separate questions. So the first is, How do we rationalize resources and resource consumption, either in one or more subscriptions? And then the second is, how do we think about managing multiple subscriptions if we have them? And those are two fundamentally different things. So a resource that I would point everyone to, to at least start thinking about this, is the Azure Enterprise Scaffold. So the Enterprise Scaffold is part of the Azure Architecture Center. It's, it kind of goes together with Virtual Data Center and Software Defined Data Center and, and a bunch of these other things. And it's meant to be a starting point or a jumping off point to go ahead and think about modeling a public cloud provider could be Azure, could be AWS, could be GCP. I mean, really, these concepts, you know, you're going to have to think about them no matter where you go. But how to think about public cloud and the data centers and the resources you consume as just an extension of your data center. So, my prem, your prem, their prem, it's just another prem. Yes, it has. PaaS and SaaS and all these other things that you might not have on prem, but it's still a prem that you know you have to manage resource consumption in. So within the Azure Enterprise Scaffold, one of the very first things that you'll run into is a little bit of guidance about defining your hierarchy and specifically defining your subscription hierarchy. And what this guidance is meant to do is help you dial into, do I need one subscription or do I need multiple subscriptions? So it can help you kind of rationalize that decision and come to a little bit of an inflection point around that. So a subscription is a billing unit. It's a boundary for billing. It's not a boundary for security because your identity lives in Azure Active Directory. That lives at the tenant level. That's that's at a higher level. So there's this relationship where you have a subscription that can be re- related to one Azure Active Directory tenant for your identity. So that's one-to-one. And that same Azure AD tenant can be related to multiple subscriptions. So it's one-to-many when we come back the other way. So it's a t- distinction between subscription and tenant. And lots of people get hung up. You know, they think about maybe a subscription as a security boundary. It's really not. It's a billing boundary. It's a way for us to put resources into the same bucket and then have them come out in an invoice for that subscription, which might be rolled up to something else. Like if you're an EA customer, right? It'll, it'll come down as burn off your enterprise agreement and your commit with Microsoft. So. When we think about a subscription as a billing boundary, like, all right, we start to throw security out the window because that lives on the other side. And we'll think about that a little bit later. What is a subscription? Well, a subscription is just the thing that I spend my resources and it's going to have limits on it. So, how many resource groups can I create a subscription? How many cores are available for per subscription or per region? How many of service X, Y, or Z that, I, that I'm looking to run can I go ahead and run? in there. So you might look at your existing production environment today and say, you know, across prod we run a thousand cores and we run, you know, these two, three hundred enterprise applications, whatever it happens to be, and across all these different business units. And then you might go back and look and say, okay, how do I build those business units? Well, I build them based on their consumption of cores and where they sit in the data center. Like maybe they consume a whole rack, so the, you know, they get billed or charged back for that rack. Okay. Well, you might want to keep them in their own billing unit inside of Azure. So maybe they go in a subscription. And and you know you might look at the next one and say okay well again billing unit subscription billing unit subscription 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 you end up with this subscription sprawl it's kind of like document sprawl in sharepoint or things like that where we just let people do stuff and they they run wild with it often in azure you find that subscription sprawl is not a great thing because there's somebody else that is going to end up with some type of management component either operations or helping apply that security from a higher level down to all the stuff that lives under underneath it. So it can be a little bit tough if we think about maybe doing like a 
a functional or a department hierarchy to, to go ahead and manage things. You know, we go application by application or department by department. You know, we create a subscription for each one of those. I'm a fan of the model that they talk about in the scaffold, which is the environmental model. And the environmental model is prod is still prod, right? You have prod in your data center today and it's segmented and it all sits in one place and you figure out how to bill it. Cool. Well, let's have a subscription for production. And then you come back to me and you say, well, how are we going to handle billing and segmentation? I don't understand that stuff. We're going to use things like tagging. We're going to use other constructs within the environment to bring all that back together and make it a little bit more sane for us when we think about invoicing and having to actually go go and do that monthly charge back or show back, whatever it happens to be along the way. And one of the things you run into in this model is... You know, there are certainly customers who, with their production environment, they can fill up an entire Azure subscription just from a limits and constraints thing. Like they need more resource groups than you can put in a single subscription. So, what happens when prod is full? Well, it really wasn't prod, it was prod one. So now we spin up prod two. And then when prod two is filled up, we spin up prod three. But it's all still production. And I like to think about it that way because it makes it a little bit easier to kind of manage and and grok and pull back together because you're managing one big billing unit at that point and then you're in full control of the segmentation within the billing unit and how you choose to apply tags or push things around within there. So regardless of the model you come up with, I think you kind of have to come up with your own decision tree based on your business construct for how you want to view billing and in Voicing for all this kind of cloudy stuff that that sits out there, and and the level of work that you're going to put into it. You know, if you have three applications and you want to go with like a, a functional model where maybe each application gets its own subscription, that's probably going to be manageable. If you have 300 applications and then you have multiple tiers and multiple life cycles for those, so you know there's prod, there's stage, there's dev, there's UAT, and now each application needs four subscriptions and you had 200 of them, and now you're at 800 Azure subscriptions, you're doing it wrong. That's going to be really hard to manage, if anything, just from a a consumption and kind of tooling perspective. You're going to have to write some custom tools and figure out how all that stuff comes together for you. PowerShell is a fantastic tool for your daily tasks as an IT pro. Wouldn't it be great if you could take PowerShell to the next level? With Script Runner, you can manage and develop your scripts in a central place. Monitor all PowerShell activities. Securely delegate scripts to help desk users and others. ScriptRunner automatically creates a web interface with no additional coding. ScriptRunner is the leading all-in-one solution for PowerShell. Get more info and your free PowerShell poster at scriptrunner.com slash en slash poster. One of those advantages, too, of breaking up those subscriptions more at that environmental level is you can take advantage of some of the different subscriptions you have because you have like those that the pay as you go dev test or just the normal pay as you go and then different options there. So you can take advantage of that pricing a little bit easier, too, when you break it up across that more across that environment level. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things, I think, where when you're sitting down and you're thinking about it and you're planning it, you go, you know, it sounds really nice to have my HR department and finance and IT all in their own subscriptions because IT is only going to be billed for IT things. They're never going to consume something from another department. Well, that's not really true, right? They use the HR system and they probably do invoicing through finance. And so there's a little bit of a shared kind of component just from application usage. But then there's the actual backend stuff that ties it all together. You know, if, if you've got multiple subscriptions with multiple virtual networks and all these kinds of things, and they need to talk to each other, you might do VNet peering, or maybe you have an express route circuit. Like you do have this shared resource. So you're going to have this mix of kind of well defined billing and peanut butter accounting, where you're going to have a little bit of kind of spreading the pain around for, for these shared resources. And those shared resources exist no matter what. Like You can think that they're not going to be there, but at some point you're going to end up with these shared resources. So why not just bite the bullet on, on day one 
and have consolidated management for identity and security in our back, which is going to make your life way easier, right? Because really at the end of the day, like is billing your problem or is security and, and people management your problem? I bet it's security and people management, like billing's a solvable problem. Figuring out all your roles and how you're going to apply them and keep them consistent and all those other things, that's a different one. The more you can keep that stuff living together becomes more manageable, especially at scale. Like if you're doing just like you said, like one, two, three subscriptions, all right, you're going to be able to pull it off. Once you get above 10, 15, and, and they start growing and you're, you're really consuming, then it becomes a lot more of a headache if you didn't put this thought up front into, what if I just ran it all in one place? How would I actually be able to segment it then? I think it's worth going through kind of that thought exercise up front and seeing where those things are going to fall out. Right. So one thing we also want to talk about is, like you said, Azure AD, as much as it's kind of that bizarre thought of, for some reason, I even always want to say it's a subscription, but Azure AD is above the subscription. You have multiple subscriptions under it. At a higher level than subscriptions, how we talked about like management groups for managing security then to these subscriptions, to the different resources, which kind of sits almost up at that Azure AD level, the security level above those subscriptions that we use for billing. So how does that hierarchy work too with those management groups? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that sit at that tenant level. So we do make the distinction between subscription and tenant. And when I say tenant, I'm always talking about Azure and Azure Active Directory tenant. That's associated with one or more downstream subscriptions, right? One to many from the top, one to one from the bottom. So at that tenant level, what you're going to end up with is kind of two constructs that are going to help you manage one or more subscriptions that are associated with that tenant. So the first that you're going to run into is this thing called management groups. So what management groups let you do is build a nested hierarchy. So think like files and folders on your desktop, that kind of thing. You know, I'm going to have a parent folder and then a child and a child and a child. So you can build this kind of folder hierarchy up to six levels deep where you're then going to place subscriptions into various management groups within that hierarchy. So it helps you first kind of logically segment them and just build out your subscriptions into a tree. So that shared subscription might live at a higher level than a departmental level subscription that lives just a, a little lower down. And it's not only going to live in the hierarchy at that level, but because it's in a management group, that's going to let you do a couple of different things with it. So you'll be able to manage things like uh, policy and RBAC, your role-based access control. So application of security and application of Azure policy, which are kind of those if this, then they, then that governance constructs we talked about with Sarah a couple weeks ago. So we'll make sure we have a link to that episode and so people can go back and listen to that as well. But now, rather than managing policy at a subscription level, say I did have three subscriptions and I've got a data sovereignty policy. So I only want to deploy resources into West Europe and North Europe. Okay, not a problem. We'll create a policy that locks your subscription down to do that. And then you go and you say, well, I'm doing the environmental thing. So I made my dev subscription all locked down. Now I need to lock down UAT or staging. How would you do that? Well, you would have to copy the policy out. You would have to go import it into the other subscription. You'd have to apply it. You'd have to assign it, You know, make sure it's all ready to go. And then you'd have to do the same thing in prod. That's a just it's a pain in the rear end, right? To have to take the same exact thing and manage it three times. And then what if I changed it in kind of the first one? So what you can do instead is take your policy and move that up to the management group level and then just associate those three subscriptions with the same management group. And then they all get the application of that policy or the application of that security declaration that you've made for that role-based access control to say, you know what? People in IT operations are going to be a reader on every subscription, no matter what, just so they can get in and see what's going on. So it lets you kind of build this natural hierarchy and lift things up to a, a little bit of a different level. Manageability now becomes 
a thing that's suddenly introduced for multiple subscriptions. Now, earlier I said, you know, managing a bunch of subscriptions at scale is not the most fun thing. And you might look at this and say, well, hold on. Now there's this hierarchy and I can manage my subscriptions at scale. Yes, but you really can't. You're still going to have to maybe go back and do a little bit of customization, maybe with PowerShell or APIs or things like that to, you know, be able to visualize the hierarchies, put them back together in your head and figure out what's actually applied and where. Where it's going, and then there's still limitations there to the the six levels deep thing within a given management group. They're there; they're a tool. They should absolutely be used. Like even if you only have one subscription, generally it's a good idea to say what are the things that we really want to control from an organizational governance perspective. And let's lift that up to the tenant level. And then we might still have things that are at the subscription level that only apply to that subscription. Because the other nice thing is if it lives in a management group, it's technically separated from Azure AD. It's in Azure AD. It's not separated. It's separated from the Azure subscription that lives underneath it. So that means that the security around your management group can be managed at the tenant level. So now we can have things like maybe you have that policy for, like I said, like IT ops can read in every subscription. You can actually lock that policy down in the management group. And then even if somebody is an owner at the subscription level, they're not able to change that, right? Because that's organizational policy. That's the stuff that's set in stone and needs to be there for whatever. And it might not be IT ops. It might be like risk management, could be audit. There's always something in an organization where somebody at least needs to be able to get in and see see all the different things that happen within it. Got it. Very nice. Obstility is disrupting cloud training as we know it with their on-demand platform, Skill Me Up. Their new design focuses on a user flow to better support role-based learning paths with these great new features. Real-time, hands-on labs are now included with each subscription to build your skills competence. Hundreds of cloud courses with more added daily to transform your skills for today's cloud-first careers. Role-based learning paths guide you through associated level courses in an easy-to-view layout and tracker. Microsoft Azure and Microsoft 365 certification prep courses and labs to support you leading up to exam day. Learn more and start your free three-day trial at www.skillmeup.com. So now let's go down the other way. So we started at subscriptions. We talked about those, kind of went up to talk about the management groups. Now, I think kind of the next level within a subscription is resource groups and how you group your resources together within a subscription. How do you have specific naming conventions and talk about that aspect. So I have how I tend to group my resources. I'm curious to see what you say about your resource grouping. Yeah, so it depends. <laughs> this is going to be like the... That's the, not allowed. Yeah, the, the classic consulting answer. Because everybody's going to be a little bit different in the way they manage things. I like to think of resource groups, like you'll run into, maybe think about it as an application. I want to think about it as a series of units of, of things, of widgets. And if I wanted to delete all those widgets at the same time, or make an update to all those widgets at the same time, I'm going to put them in a resource group. Resource groups let you, they're a scope with in Azure. So we've got that management group scope, right, where we can apply, have our policy come down and our security. There's the subscription scope, where again, we can have policy and security. And then there's the resource group and the resource level. And because of the way RBAC inherits and that role-based access control inherits down, you can think about it as put all the widgets together that need to be managed in the same place or by the same people, and then maybe by widget lifecycle or object or resource lifecycle, whatever you want to call it. So in the case of of let's take a maybe like a multi-tier web application. So it has maybe it's running a PaaS service like Azure Web Apps, and that's the web tier. So that app service is going to have an app service plan and it's going to have the web app that's associated with it. That might be managed by the actual application developers, by your ops team, whatever it happens to be. So that probably goes in a resource group. Like I want the security for the app service plan and the, and the web app to be the same thing. And you know what? If I delete the app service plan, I certainly want to be able to delete the web app at the same time. Like, There's no point in 
leaving the web app behind if I'm getting rid of the unit compute. There might be a reason, but let's pretend there's not in this case. And then I've got this other thing. I get this database. Is the database part of the application? Like, is it used exclusively by that application? Well, if it is, I probably want it to live in the same resource group. If it's not, and it's shared database instance, and it's shared and maybe managed by your DBAs, let's take that one and put that one in its own resource group. What about the network? Well, there's probably a VNet or some subnets or some network security groups things. Those are probably managed by the networking team. Like, Are they part of your application or does your application consume them? In most cases, your application consumes them. So that's probably another resource group with its own security, its own constraints, and things that come against it. The balance really comes down to things like limits and constraints. So when we think about Azure limits and quotas, specifically at the subscription group level, you're going to be limited to the number of uh, resource groups that you can just create per subscription. So there's just a couple of things that kind of come into play right off the top. So you're limited to 980 resource groups per subscription. This is part of the rationalization thing, right? You got to go back and, and kind of figure that out and do a little bit of planning and a little bit of forethought around. Is it the end of the world that you only have 980 per subscription? Absolutely not. Because remember, we can do prod one, prod two, app one, app two, whatever that model that you've decided for subscriptions is. Yep. And that tends to be how I do my resource groups too. Like I'll spin up a brand new resource group if I'm going to do a demo of something because I want all the resources with that demo in one resource group. Like you said, then it makes it easy to, to, to delete them, to see everything I used for that demo. I have one resource group that I put pretty much everything I do for testing in. I have another resource group that has more production stuff. I tend to bundle mine within a resource group based on kind of what you said, more of that application are these all part of the same function within Azure and belong together in that logical group? Because it does, it makes it easy then to go in and see, okay, these are all the things that are associated with my test environment or my production environment or this demo I did. I'll create a resource group if I'm doing a specific demo for a specific conference so that after I'm done with that demo for that conference, I know, you know what, I'm not going to use this one again. I just want to blow away everything associated with this. I'll do it that way. And that kind of leads into another question here too about even do you do things differently between IAs and PaaS for resources, at least when it comes to resource groups, I mix them all together because you may have that IAs, you may have that VM, but you also may be leveraging an Azure SQL database and a web app. And these multiple services, both IAs and PaaS services, may all be associated with that single application. And I still want them all in that single resource group from a management. Sometimes it's even for security. I have a contractor working on it. He needs access to create stuff, to work on stuff in this resource group. Here's the resource group. Go do what you need to in this resource group so I know it's all sitting there together. Yeah, I think it's a little bit different. It depends on where you're coming from. So as a consultant, or like you said, you're spinning up dev environments, things up down all the time, you know, we want them to be easy to delete. So yeah, we got a bunch of widgets and or you know these resources and we want them to be kind of consumed and then go away really quick. Realistically, once you're into production environments or more established workloads, now we're going to think about security and security inheritance, so that role-based access control inheritance. And it's not so much about deleting all the things at once, it's about being able to apply a logical security model to them all at once and get them to where they need to be. Either way, we're talking about the same thing, right? How we group those resources and put them together. And the, there's some guidance in that scaffold about those as well. So it's not just subscription hierarchies, there's all sorts of stuff if you go through that. There's naming standards, there's how to think about your networking and maybe tie that back into an enterprise network. There's just a lot going on there and it's worth taking the time to go through it. Mover is a cloud migration company that specializes in moving your company's files from file servers or cloud storage like Box, Dropbox, and Google into Office 365. Their patented technology makes Mover the fastest OneDrive file migrator in the world. Moving dozens of terabytes of data a day is a breeze. Use Mover's free, industry-leading migration guides 
or ask for a managed migration and they'll take the lead. With Mover, all your data is secure and intact. Running completely behind the scenes, you don't lose time, money, or hair while you transfer. Scan, plan, migrate, report. Migrations that don't suck with Mover. Visit mover.io for more info. All right, so kind of the last topic, the last piece of all of this we wanted to talk about was tagging where now you have your subscription, you have resources and your resource groups, and now you can actually go through and apply one or more tags to those various resources within your resource groups, within your subscriptions. What role do those tags play when you get into managing all your services in Azure? So the big one for me is going to be billing. Like I said, if you get into that model where you're maybe in that that environmental model of pushing things out into prod one and when prod one fills up, you go to prod two and prod three and, and things like that. You're going to have a bunch of different applications, a bunch of different application owners, a bunch of different things that you need to be able to figure out where the heck they came from. So billing is usually one of the, one of the biggest ones so you know having a piece of metadata that's associated with a given resource like that app service plan or the web app that sits underneath it to say have maybe like a cost center, a GL code, something like that. Or maybe like who's the application owner? What's the business unit this is associated with? What's what's the business need? Whatever it happens to be. So those are all going to be applied through tags. Tags have just like subscriptions, they have limits or constraints to them. So you're limited to 15 tags per resource. And you can tag at the resource group level or at the resource level. But unlike role-based access control, there's no concept of tag inheritance. So what I mean there is, say you applied a cost center tag at a resource group, and you would think that, oh, cool, that tag is automatically going to be applied to every resource that exists underneath that resource group and every new resource I spin up. That's not the case. They can have totally separate tags, and they're differentiated. So there's no concept of tag inheritance. So the first thing you need to think about with governance and tags is pretty much tagging every single resource that's going to support tags. There's a handful that don't support tags, but that's okay. They're kind of out in the ether. Manageable, and you can figure that stuff out. It's all well documented. But every resource should get a tag. And then, you know, we talked about policy and being able to apply this organizational governance down from either the management group level or the subscription group or subscription or resource group, whatever it happens to be. So maybe you'll have a policy that says we want to enforce our cost center tag. So every resource that gets created must have a tag that says cost center. If it doesn't have that tag at the time the deployment's submitted or the person goes to create the resource, maybe they do it through like PowerShell or the CLI, we want it to air out and kick back and say, uh uh uh, you don't have a tag, right? It's kind of like, you know, Nedry and Jurassic Park coming back to get everybody and wag his finger. And that's a valid use for policy. Or maybe we just want to have a default tag. So, you know, I'm running up that production subscription. So I've got prod one. Maybe I just want to have a tag that says environment and the value is production. And I want to apply that to everything that goes into that subscription automatically. So that way, when I pull my detailed usage and my invoice across prod and dev and all these different things, now I have a way to figure out what environment it lived in and what cost center it was associated with. That tends to be probably one of the biggest ones that's out there. Should you use tags? Yes, absolutely. Like I would consider them a requirement and I would think really hard about, you know, applying them through policy as well, either enforcing them or applying a default tag just to make sure you have something there. Yeah, and the tags are a little different too than what you may even think of if you're used to tagging in OneNote or an Outlook where it's like a word where you tag it with client or you tag it with just that single word. These are name value pair tags. So it's like you said, it's environment is the name, and then you can give it a value of dev, of prod, of test, or client, and then you can give it the client name. So it's a little bit different from that tagging. And this is something I actually don't know. Do tags span subscriptions? So if you have environment prod as a tag in multiple subscriptions, can you pull all the resources across those subscriptions 
buy that tag? Kind of, sort of. It depends on your user and, and your context and, and where you sit. There are ways to query an ARM across multiple subscriptions and see what's going on. Really, your challenge there is you've got to make sure that that environment tag is spelled the same way and applied consistently, which is where management groups and policy might come into play. Because we're just talking about strings. And right. strings are weird things. You know, They could be uppercase, they could be lowercase, they could have have a space in the beginning, a space in the end, depending on who fired it off and when it went in. So we really want to make sure that policy is there to help us enforce the standard so that then we can go back and, and figure some of that stuff out later. So you might do that maybe through like a billing API or usage API, or you might just be in finance and actually taking your usage CSVs, like your detailed CSVs, which are going to have your tags as a column the JSON formatted tags are going to come out as a column in your invoice or in your detailed usage. And you're going to be able to go ahead and maybe even pull that into Excel and, and do your comparison there across sheets or whatever it happens to be. All right. Sounds good. Well, that about wraps us up. I think we covered everything around managing resources and how you would go about lumping them together and managing those different groups and how you can group different resources in Azure together. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that, that goes into this. So we've kind of scratched the surface. If people are interested, so go out and read through the enterprise scaffold. You know, click the download to PDF button, pull it offline. Like there's there's a lot of good content in there. If you are a Microsoft partner, and you're in kind of Microsoft cloud infrastructure practices, things like that. There is a cloud infrastructure practice accelerator, which is called Hybrid Cloud Foundation. And one of the nicest things within there is they, they call them SAWs, it's Solution Alignment Workshops. So it's something that you as a partner can go deliver for customers. Or you you might have gone through one of these workshops, you know, if you're at a larger enterprise and you've had like Microsoft consulting services come in and help you out. And there's sample functional specs in there, but there's some really good PowerPoint decks in there. So like the guidance for naming policies inside of the Azure Enterprise Scaffold you know, it says come up with a naming policy, but it doesn't actually spell out the constraints. Like VM names can only be 16 characters long. Storage account names must always be lowercase and can't contain this, that, and that, and the other thing. There's a PowerPoint deck in the saws, which is just phenomenal, which spells out like naming constraints for 40 different resource types or, or service types. And it gives you examples of them and how to think about them and then how to apply them with tags and policy and things like that. There's a bunch of stuff out there. And, and once you start digging into it, I think it's a little bit easier to wrap your head around Like once you get hands-on with some of it. All right, perfect. And we'll include a bunch of links to all that stuff too in the show notes so you can go... Grab those off the website, sign up for the mailing list, and just get all those links delivered right to your email, however you prefer to get those. So thanks a lot, Scott. Good discussion. A little longer today, but covered it well. Yeah, well. And hopefully we answered the question. <laughs> we'll we'll see what happens more. In, in the next one. Or yes. maybe we generated more questions. Exactly. And if we generated more questions, ask more questions, and then we have even more stuff to talk about. So Excellent. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Scott. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.